This week, Jared Atkinson, Chief Strategist at Spectre Ops, will be discussing the evolution of purple teaming. In the security news, the exploit prediction scoring system is awesome, or so some say, reflections on InfoSec and free RDP, why some people don't trust science, SSH snake, back in the driver's seat, I hacked my internet service provider for reasons, state and Congress wrestle with cybersecurity, combining AI with human brain cells, analyzing Linux dash firmware, detecting BLE spam, and the I in LLM. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. In the ever-present threat of cyber attacks, even a simple wrong click can spell disaster. ThreatLocker built endpoint protection so you can operate a zero-trust security posture built on a default deny. ThreatLocker allows you to control what runs and what those applications can do, access, and how they interact. Don't let your trusted applications be used against you. For comprehensive protection against evolving threats, turn to ThreatLocker Cyber Heroes at securityweekly.com forward slash ThreatLocker. Identity is at the core of every great digital experience. Ping Identity solutions support the scale, flexibility, and resiliency required by enterprise-level IT teams for lasting digital transformation. With 99.99% uptime and over 3 billion identities under management, they're the only identity vendor that's proven to champion the scale, performance, and security of large enterprises. That's why Ping Identity champions your unique identity needs. They give you the tools to offer your users the right access at the right times, no matter how they connect with you. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. Coming to you in super low definition compliments of Darth Vader himself, this is Paul Security Weekly episode number 812 being recorded on January 10th, 2024, right here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. To my left, very special in-studio guest, Mr. Dave Johnson is here with us. Dave, welcome. Thank you. You were like the, my go-to 3D printer. You and Larry are like my go-to, both. <laughs> both of you, go-to 3D printer uh, people. It's so. good to have friends in printing. Yes. Uh, you're inspiring me. I'm going to have my own 3D printer at some point probably this year. Yeah. And the folks like myself who have bamboo printers are, are the worst. We're just trying to get everybody to buy the same printer that we have. So right. that's my mission from now on. I'm, yeah, I'm skipping right over the Ender 3. I'm going right to, yeah. right to bamboo. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Josh Marpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. Hey, pleasure to be here. Um, but I got to ask, Dave, I just heard about the, the bamboo stealing code or something. And uh, I want to ask your thoughts on that later, but we'll talk. Yeah, let's cover yeah, that in the news. Great. Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Great to be back. Looking forward to 2024. And I'm ready for the purple conversation. Purple conversations. I just, I just don't know which way I'm leaning. We'll find out. <clears throat> Mr. Sam Bown is here with us. Sam, welcome. Good evening. Glad to see you folks. Ready for another year. And announcing uh, him last because of his hat, Mr. Bill Swearingen is here with us. Bill, welcome. <laughs> Hey guys, uh, happy new year. It's a new year, new me. Uh, live, laugh, love, and let's go Kansas City. I, I can I can see you with the live, laugh, love signs like in your in your house. You're into that stuff, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Cyber threats are evolving in your organization. Uh, are you keeping up? The 2023 Cybersecurity Year in Review is here. Uncover the latest challenges and strategic responses in CRA's 2023 Cybersecurity Year in Review sponsored by the RSA conference. From the impact of generative AI to the risk of ransomware to navigating new SEC rulings, get ahead for 2024 with your free copy that you can download at securityweekly.com forward slash year in review 2023. As always, you can visit my website, securitypodcaster.com. You can find the podcast I host, some book recommendations, my up-to-date bio, and so much more at securitypodcaster.com. Hey, Jack, Paul, are yes. you sure you introduced everybody? Uh, maybe. Check, all, not. check all your screens. I did. Tyler. Who did I miss? Tyler. Tyler. I missed Tyler because he's not up on my screen. Tyler Robinson is also here with us. Tyler, 
Welcome to the show, Love my friend. Love you, buddy. There he is. And happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Yes. Again, today is my birthday. It is the second podcast, oh. Tyler. And oh. I'll look at that. You even have oh. a faux, a faux oh. cake. I love it. I love it. Uh, Larry's going to jump out of that later. We just have to wait till the end of the show. <clears throat> Sweet. Is it like In a, a miniature? Mankini. It's a miniature 3D printed version of Larry. Well, it's it's a tesseract. <laughs> it's actually a tesseract. It's a tesseract. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's going to appear. Time and space. Oh, that's great. But does he wear uh, the mankini? I, oh, we're going to have to only find hope. Don't spoil it. Jared Atkinson is a security researcher who specializes in uh, digital forensics and incident response. Recently, he's been building and leading private sector hunt operation capabilities. In his previous life, Jared led incident response missions for the U.S. Air Force hunt team, detecting and removing advanced persistent threats on Air Force and DOD networks. Passionate about PowerShell and the open source community, Jared is the leader of Power Forensics, Uproot, and maintains a DFIR-focused blog at invoke-ir.com. Jared, welcome back to Security Weekly. Thanks, Paul. And I'm quite honored to be here on your birthday. You didn't tell me about that when we chatted the other day. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I also love the New England Revolution jersey there. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm a football jersey collector myself. So Yeah, my, my sons are like super into football or soccer, as it soccer. were. Right. Yeah. And uh, so they've gotten me into it as a as a byproduct. So uh, I make them happy when I wear the, the jerseys there you as go. well. Sometimes there you we go. have matching jerseys on. It's It's great. It's great. <laughs> Some of those jerseys are hard to get now, man. They're expensive. Yes. Oh yeah. I want I want to make a messy jersey, but the last time I looked, I I couldn't find. Dude, and I, I just I just got a a new messy jersey, and it was not cheap. I know I know some people that can help with that. I gotta tap into that. Mm. We'll talk after. Um. So Jared, you were on the show like many moons ago. Oh yeah, probably five years ago at least. I would imagine. Well, it's good to have <laughs> you back. About, That's we why you look familiar. Power. Yeah, we talked about power forensics, I believe, which is okay. one of the things that you just mentioned in the bio. But, nice. But now you're on like a, you've got a really awesome take on on purple teaming that I can't wait to dive into. Jared, why don't you start by just kind of giving us uh, your philosophy behind purple teaming? Sure, sure. Yeah, so add, add some a, history I, to that though. Like, there's there's some history as part of your journey that I mm. don't want to get missed as well uh, for how you got to this purple teaming. Yeah, no, of, I like that. Start with the history. Yeah. Okay. Um, man. Okay. Well, so I, 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 a defender by trade. So kind of, you talked about in my bio, I, I worked for the U S air force hunt team kind of helped to stand that up initially. Um, as part of that, I got into kind of like this detection engineering threat hunting kind of, kind of thing. It's evolved over time. Um, uh, one of the things that, that I've got really interested in was we started to see these, uh, miter attack evals. And generally speaking, uh, what people, what the consumer was really looking for was this question of, I have, I've, I've either bought some sort of security system, some EDR or some, something along those lines, or I've hired a bunch of people and I've given them time and resources to build security controls, specifically detections is what people mostly think about, but also preventative controls or security configurations. And the question that they have a lot of times that they're looking to things like the MITRE attack eval uh, to answer is, how do I know that my investment in those areas is actually solving the problems that we set out to invest, right? So there's something like I built a detection at, at a more kind of uh, granular perspective. I built a detection rule and I want to know, let's say for detecting credential dumping from LSAS or process injection or whatever it might be. I want to know that if that attack were to occur in my environment, what is the probability that my detection rule would actually fire or that my preventative control would actually stop the thing from happening? And the the more I looked into that, the more I became potentially cynical at the way that we were trying to approach solving that problem. And kind of simultaneously, I started hearing about... Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean by uh, potentially cynical? <laughs> Let's I'm trying explain to be that a one. little bit. I'm trying to be a little bit nice, I guess. I think huh? yeah, Jared, was trying to be, Jared was trying you're to be cynical. nice. Yeah. You were cynical. <laughs> Sure. Very, very you're, cynical. You're a monk's so, friend. When you get to okay. Jeff and I's age, you're done with the, the being nice and minting words. Yeah, there's no adjectives. <laughs> when okay. This whole... Very, very cynical. So the, um, the, the problem that I see um, with the kind of evaluate, I say evaluation of efficacy of security controls is the way that I, I try to frame that. The, the, the problem that I end up seeing is a lot of times people will run one variation of process injection. So they'll, they'll get their favorite tool or like for LSAS credential dumping, they'll grab Mimikatz or some variation thereof. 
they'll run that and then they'll evaluate whether their detection rule fired an alert. And if it did, they're like, we're good to go. If it didn't, then they'll kind of be like, okay, we got to go back to the drawing board. Now, the problem is that there's actually a very large number of variations that can achieve the same outcome, right? So I could write tools that have all kinds of differences. Any red teamer is going to know this, right? Um, and sometimes those differences are very big, right? So you could make a, a major change to how you approach doing process injection, or you can make a very small change. A small change would be something like changing a single byte, which would change the hash, right? And uh, the problem is, is that if I only run one test case, right, or maybe even just a few test cases, the chances that I'm actually getting a valid outcome of the test to be able to allow me to say, I'm confident that if process injection were to happen, I'll detect it, that's, uh, the likelihood is very small. And so the, maybe the, to wrap it into the purple team idea, I started hearing purple teaming and um, being cynical again. A lot of times when people talk about purple teaming, they, they don't go very deep in their kind of definition. And they'll say something along the lines of, well, purple teaming is where red and blue work together to uh, increase the security posture of an organization or something along those lines. But the, the real question is, is like, well, what are you working together to do Right. So what are you actually trying to accomplish? How are you trying to accomplish that? And so as I started digging into what are people actually talking about, they're they're trying to answer this efficacy problem, which is how do I build controls that actually solve the problems that we face that are being posed by adversaries or attackers or what, whatever it might be? Maybe that's a good place to stop. There's, not, there's still not very many companies that have really gotten fully on board with that definition. I mean, we've seen this in red team, right? Like the, the understanding of what red team was and, and what it should be in order to improve an organization still to this day, red teaming is, is not very well understood and is not utilized in the correct way. Same thing for purple teaming though. Like I think you guys were very far ahead of the game. Like we were talking about this in what, 2014. This was yep. how things should have been done, but that heuristic based and behavior based training is really hard. This comes back to a lot of the shows we do that, that say easy, do hard that Jason loves to, uh, to promote is very easy to say, you're going to collaborate and work on detections and do this, the how, and the how integration with a, a broad scope becomes a very different problem. So how, how do you see this evolving and what are some of the things that have evolved over the years in order to make this uh, a more viable and, and scalable problem to fix? Yeah, sure. So uh, Tyler, as you know, like as, uh, just to go back a little bit, at SpectreOps, we do kind of red team. It is one of our, uh, that's our bread and butter, I guess. And one of the things that we noticed is that during a red team, there's, there's a limitation of a red team and how it's how it's being operated is generally there's a narrative that you're trying to fit it within, right? So uh, each step along the way, every action that you take has to fit within this narrative. And that causes you to actually be constrained in a certain way, right? Which means that I can't just test a bunch of random things because I want to be progressing th towards some objective, right? Um, and so if, if I'm laterally moving, right, I'm going to, and I'm on a red team, I'm going to laterally move in a way that works Right? But I'm not going to go through and stop and say, okay, let's go through every single iteration of lateral movement that we know about. And so the problem with the red team is if I detect, let's say I'm a defender and I detect the red team, the question is, is does me detecting the red team indicate that I would detect an arbitrary attack that might occur in the future? And the answer is, is you have no clue because you, you haven't collected sufficient data to be able to make any claim like that. Um, so the question is, is did you detect them because they just happened to do it in the way that you expected them to do it or you were prepared for, or did you detect them because you have a, a comprehensive solution? And the answer is, is nobody, nobody has any idea. The kind of follow up to your, to your other question is, is okay, well, here's, here's the big, the big rub, I guess, as we start to look into these different attack techniques, right? Let's say we're trying to build behavior based detections or use heuristics or something along those lines. Uh, one of the things that we have to start saying is, what are all of the different ways that attackers can actually implement this thing? And uh, just to give one example, I've started looking into all the different kind of variations of uh, process injection, of token manipulation, token theft, of uh, credential dumping from LSAS. And one of the things, you could look at it in a bunch of different ways, but we've, we've estimated that there's about 4.4 million different variations that can be implemented for process injection. And so one of the big problems is if I choose during a red team or during uh, some sort of kind of evaluation, only one variation, 
that that one variation is not going to be representative of the 4.4 million different possibilities. And so that that creates a problem. I mean, you're talking about a chess problem. This is a chess problem. This is a problem where there are so many variables that it's almost incalculable as to what's going to happen. And so a skilled player narrows it down and, and things like that. But then, yep. uh, sorry, it's just, it just, it reminded me of, 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 of trying yep. to calculate chess and it's almost impossible to do. Very much so. Yeah. So one of the things that we, we kind of do when we start looking at this is we start saying, okay, there's 4.4 million variations. But this is, it's, uh, it probably could actually be something that uh, would be a good AI use case, although I'm very skeptical of the- I was, I was just about to ask that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm skeptical of a lot of the implementations of AI and security products, but there, there are valid use cases, right? And so one of the things that we, we could start looking at is among those 4.4 million variations, there's going to be some, they're, they're going to cluster, right? So certain variations are going to be more similar. So a variation, what I'm, when I talk about variations, um, imagine that the kind of standard variation or standard implementation of process injection follows the open process, virtual alloc, write process memory, create remote thread kind of API flow. So that's the, those are the functions that get called. If I'm an attacker and I understand that somebody is very interested in say, create remote thread, right? So create remote thread, that, that's going to be represented by a thread being created in a remote process. And so defenders can start to build detections that are looking for threads being created in, in a process that was initiated by some foreign process. And that might be their heuristic that they're using. Go ahead. So is this root cause analysis of detection points in time of execution? Yeah, there's, there's something along the lines of like choke points. So when you're, when you're thinking about detection, the way that I start to think about this, this is a little bit different than the purple team, but when, maybe it provides good, good kind of foundation for this. When I start thinking about it, what I want to do is I want to say, what are the changes that are being made on the system? What are the, oper I call them operations, the actions that are being taken against objects. So for instance, a thread is an object, a process is an object, a file is an object, right? I could read a file, I could write a file, I could um, delete a file. So I want to track what are the types of operations that must occur uh, in order to perform this behavior. And it's usually some sort of chain, right? So in this case, I have to open a handle to a process. I have to allocate memory in the process. So that would be, you know, allocating memory. I have to write to the memory. So that would be something like writing to the process. And then I have to create a thread. Those are the four operations that are occurring. And so when I'm a de defender, I, I, those operations kind of correspond with events. So there's like a sysmon event ID 10 would be that process, process open. You're opening a handle to a process, but there's also a sysmon event ID eight, for instance, that's a create remote thread uh, operation. So the thread being created. And so as a defender, I got to choose which one of those do I want to build my detection on? You, you choose, you basically choose one and then you kind of pivot off of that. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of different strategies. There's a lot of different opinions on why you might choose one over the other. But as an attacker, what you start to do is you start to pay attention to what are the trends that are popping up amongst kind of the defensive community? What are the trends that are popping up amongst the EDR? And this is where that evolution kind of idea comes in is imagine that the EDR is uh, applying a selective pressure on the attacker, right? And so what they're doing is if, a, if an EDR is saying, we're going to really pay attention to when people are opening handles to a certain process, say LSAS for credential dumping. Um, then attackers start to say, okay, I still want to dump credentials from LSAS, but now I know that CrowdStrike or Sentinel One or wh whomever is paying attention to people opening handles to LSAS. So is there a way for me to still achieve the outcome that I'm interested in without performing that operation. And that's where you start to see these variations start to pop up because there's where there's a will, there's a way. And this goes into that kind of like chess, chess problem that we were talking about. I mean, this is a, this is a much better solution to, to the, the long-term problem. And you guys are really doing that root cause analysis at a low level, which again is something that it, a lot of people are doing this at a much higher level. They're trying with process procedures. They're doing a bunch of other methods to do this. But the low level, like you're getting that detection point and a high fidelity in an area where we're over logging, we have over visibility, we've got, you know, alert fatigue, all the things. So how do how do places begin their journey of getting a good purple team and establishing those baselines and building these these graphs that you're you're doing is very much okay, uh sure. 
similar to like uh, to Bloodhound for the low level APIs of chain functions and and uh, execution uh, methods. It's it's great. Yeah, so the I think the way that you really start doing this is you you start looking for what's known. What are the variations? So pick you pick a behavior that you're interested in, process injection, whatever it might be. Um, it could be service creation is one that I've looked into a lot, right? So you could use service creation for lateral movement, for instance. Um, and what you what you start doing is you say, I want to go and do research and find every implementation that's out there, whether it's on GitHub, whether it's in a threat report of somebody using service creation for lateral movement. And then what you, what you start doing is you start breaking them down. This is, it's reverse engineering, but I would say it's kind of like light reverse engineering. I'm, I'm by no means a reverse engineer in the proper sense, but I, I, could, I could do this, right? Um, and what you do is you start saying, what is, the, what is the sequence of API functions that were being called? And generally speaking, those API functions correspond with one of those operations that I was talking about. Um, and then you compare and contrast different uh, samples, right? So you look at sample one, you break it down, you say, okay, to create a service, they have to call, you know, open SC manager, create service. Um, and then you look at sample two and you say, okay, this also calls open SC manager, create service. Those are similar. Those are going to be very, very similar. But then you look at a third sample and there, and it's, it's not even calling the same APIs. Instead, what it's doing is it's writing to the registry. And what you find out is that actually services are registered in the, in the windows registry on a system. And so you can bypass kind of that service creation level um, of resolution and go straight to the registry and make those changes directly. And so that would be a variation that is more different. And the more different a variation is, the more likely your detection strategy is, is going to fail or your security control is going to fail. And now, is there Jared, an auto Jared, automated way to do that? Oh, sorry, go ahead, someone else. <laughs> I was just going to say, ask Jared, um, how do we manage false positives in this context? Yeah, yeah so great question. So there's... First, I, I always have to say that uh, there's two types of error, obviously, false positives and false negatives. And the one of the big things that we have that we have a problem with is we false positives are conspicuous by definition. So you're going to if a false positive occurs, you're going to encounter it because it's going to raise some sort of alert or something like that. Mm. The problem is, is that false negatives are invisible. Right. And so a lot of times we have a tendency to over prioritize false positives. The the other thing that we found that's been pretty successful is, and this is where I actually, I'm a, again, also cynical of the idea of threat hunting in general. Uh, and that's like where I came from. That's where I started, but I'm, I'm a little, little skeptical of it. Um, but one of the places where I find that that's actually quite useful is when you build, when you do a threat hunt, for instance, you're kind of blazing new ground, you're, you're trailblazing in some sense. And one of the things that you're doing is you're kind of getting a lay of the land. You're seeing what's normal. You're trying to figure things out. And you also have a much narrower scope of what you're focused on. And so like, let's say I'm doing that service creation kind of detection thing. Well, it's one thing to detect that a service was created. It's a completely different thing to identify whether or not the service that was created is malicious or benign, right? And so what you, what you would do is you would say, okay, first, when I'm building this detection, I want to make sure that if a service is created, no matter how it's being created, I want to know about it, right? But then there's a second step that's really important. This helps you to reduce these false positives, which is, okay, well, now I have to start building some sort of uh, scoring mechanism that allows me to differentiate between uh, benign and legitimate services. Now, when you first start looking at something, everything is novel, right? So everything, if you, the first day you look at services, every service is going to be new and it's going to be something that you've never seen before. But what you can do, because you have, as a threat hunter or a detection engineer, you have a much smaller scope you can you can afford to dig into those uh, novel services, and you can start to build up kind of a, a knowledge base of what services are normal, what services are you seeing across the across the enterprise, and then over time, and we've we've done this with services in large large enterprises. Over time, you get to the point to where the occurrence of novelty actually becomes negligible to the point mm -hmm. to where after after fourteen days of analysis, let's say. Um, there's like three new services a day. Right. Three new, Unless they're like, hacked unique. like really bad, like a lot, <laughs> right? Yeah, Which yeah, you yeah, hope yeah. is not. There would be other no, but, indicators, I think, if they were hacked so bad that the threat actor activity shows up as normal, right? So, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, something you mentioned earlier about red teaming and, and the solutions that you're putting forth is that the solution, part of the reason why red teaming has issues is that 
it's very habitual as, as pen testers will often do the same things that they're used to and then look for that result and go, I did the thing. Oh, here's the evidence of that thing. And it's hard to iterate on that and find new things and new creativity. Your methodology might also apply to threat hunting in a similar way, or I'm going to use the term thrunting as the kids say these days. Um, <laughs> Have you given that some consideration? Like, is that something else you want to tackle with your philosophy and very wait, wait, zen approach? Who the hell do you here? think is a kid? I don't know. Anybody younger than me, of course. No, no, no. no oh, God damn. I'm old. You're, you're a kid yourself. Anyway. I mean, you have a hoku sai in back of you. Like, you know. I, I would say, um, I would say, I, like, so I come from, like, kind of a detection engineering background. So I am trying to use... Purple team. Purple teaming is more of like a service, the implementation of from my this is my perspective, right? It's the it's the evaluation of the product of detection engineering or or threat hunting, right? Um, but then you would use that same mindset to say, as I'm building a detection rule, I want to understand, I take some sample, right? And generally speaking, you're there's going to be like the canonical sample for whatever technique it is. So Mimi Cats would be the canonical sample for LSS credential dumping. Um, incognito would be the canonical sample for uh, token theft, for instance. And so you look at the canonical sample, you say, how does this actually work? And then you build your detection. And then you want to iterate and find more, more samples and figure out, are they, you know, invalidating the assumptions or the the ideas that you have when you built your, your detection rule or your strategy? That's just so good I think, science. I think it does. Yeah. Well, and that's the, that's, that's a great point. Um, one of the things that we want to do is we want to control variables, right? And so as we're doing, as we're testing multiple samples, so for purple teaming, for me, it's like an active testing. So I, I create a list of different variations that I've you know, uniquely selected in order to, to uh, accentuate the differences between the samples, right? Um, but I don't want to change everything all at once because the problem is, is remember, uh, in that process injection example, there were four different operations. But the detection rule is focused on only one operation at a time. And so if I change everything and it doesn't detect it, I don't actually know what, what was working the first time. Let's say you detect sample A and then I, I run sample B, but sample B is completely different. Yeah. The problem is, is that I don't know why it failed because I don't actually, a lot of times people don't know what their detections are actually doing because maybe it's a vendor, some sort of vendor provided detection rule yeah. that you, you don't even have insight into how it works. Hey Jared, so I think I think you've been really successful in proving that everything's broken and you know everything <laughs> sucks. But you know yeah. I'm I'm curious like so so given given what you're describing there, who do you think whose responsibility is it to do that? Right. So are we expecting companies to be checking out those millions of different vectors, or should we be leaning on our endpoint providers to do that? Where, where do you think that that the ownership of of you know of that detection analysis yeah. where does that lie? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a, also a great question. We kind of have a debate about this internally. Uh, we we uh, we offer a uh, purple teaming service, but th there's there's a question about whether or not like the end user should be should be pursuing that, right? Because uh, there's there's for instance, let's say I present you with a variation that you can't detect, but the problem is is that you literally don't even have the telemetry to detect it anyway. Well, you you can't really do anything about that. So then you just kind of know you're screwed, um, which is which is better than thinking you're good. Right, but it's not better than fixing the problem. And so, a lot of times, uh, working with like the vendors themselves is going to be ideal because then they have the capability to actually expand the visibility. Because sometimes, sometimes the reason why your detection fails is because uh, the product doesn't actually have visibility into the type of behavior or the type of operation that that is necessary in order to detect detect what's going on. Uh, other times, you may just be excluding something for whatever reason because you were trying to tune, but maybe you overtuned or something along those lines. Um, I would say, like big picture, it's incumbent upon, in my opinion, it's incumbent upon the end user, so the the organization, to work to understand whether or not their security controls are actually doing what they think they're doing. So there, there's the idea of like you should understand the amount of risk that you're accepting. And so you shouldn't just blindly believe that things work. Uh, you shouldn't just buy into kind of what the product is selling you. Um, but I also believe that it's incumbent upon the vendors to make sure that they're uh, constantly pursuing making their their product and the service and the the capability better for for the end user that they're selling to. So yeah, everything's broken. Like everybody lies. Yeah. And like 
we might as well just turn off our computers and go home. I, no, I, you know, but, uh, Jared, I don't think that's what you're saying, right? I think you're saying you can increase your chances of earlier stage detection with these techniques, yep. and it's not going to be 100%. When you say that there's four point something million ways yep. <clears throat> to do process injection, right? None of us sitting here thinking, well, if I cover all those 4.4 million yep. ways, like I'm good, right? We're like, if I can get the best detection that I can, I have to rely on things later on in, the, in my defenses, dare I say defense in depth, right, to, to yep. identify those. I'm making the attacker's job harder by detecting more of those things in earlier stages, which is where I really yep. think defense is at. Yeah, well, there's this uh, really great visualization where they talk about, um, basically, it's like, there, it's a lossy process from, you like, it's easier to understand what the problem is than it is to understand what the solution is. It's easier yeah. to understand what the solution is than it is to implement practically the solution, right? So it's a lossy process. If you don't understand what the problem is, then you can't understand the solution. If you don't understand the solution, you can't implement it. Like one example that that we give is we were looking at when we were looking at services, one of the one of the features of a potentially malicious service would be like a randomly generated name, right? And so I, as a human being, can look at a service name and say, Oh, that looks that looks weird. That's that seems to be random to me. But actually, detecting random strings is actually like a relatively unsolved problem in mm -hmm. in AI, right? So in data science, so like n nobody, it's it's not very. It's one thing to say we should look for random strings. It's a whole nother thing to create an algorithm that would allow right. you to identify mm -hmm. that a string is random. And so um, I say that to say this: the 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 general idea is the capability that comes out of the box for your EDR is less than uh, the potential that exists, right? And so there's there's a gap between like what a what a standard user is going to be doing with an EDR, somebody that just buys it, plugs it in, and like it has capability. They're they're pretty good. They're focused on a lot of the like those canonical threats that I that I'm talking about. Um, but a power user is able is going to be able to extend the capability pretty significantly. Um, but then there becomes there's an extent to where at some point you're going to reach the end of that. And there's going to be some problems that you don't have the capability to solve yourself as, as the end user, you're going to, you're going to depend upon the vendor to expand the capability, maybe add new event types, all that, that kind of stuff. The, one of the kind of, again, cynical ideas is that, uh, the vendors generally speaking in like software development, there's the, the consumer has a lot of control over the roadmap of how products are being developed. And so, uh, if nobody's complaining about the lack of visibility, that's probably not going to be prioritized by by the vendor, generally speaking. Um, and so one thing that we I think is really useful about kind of getting the end user on board is to help them to understand and be able to make an articulated argument to their vendor about what the problems are, where their visibility gaps are, how how they would like to see it expand so that they can solve these problems. Here's some examples of what we would like to detect that we're currently not solving for. Um, that's, that's maybe the real answer is the end user. First of all, you want to, you don't want to be blind, like willfully, willfully ignorant on like what your actual security posture is. So we help to like purple teaming could help to understand that as we evaluate, Hey, you detect this thing, but not this thing. Um, but it also helps you to be able to make those arguments as a consumer of a product to the vendor and hopefully that they'll improve it. Are there, Even are there though, automated mechanisms or frameworks being developed that allow you to do what you're talking about and tie those to things like uh, Atomic Red Team or MITRE ATT&CK uh, or around TTPs and behaviors? Is there automated systems and or the ability to get some visualization and kind of graph mapping to prioritize the different layers in which you're going to have the most... Uh, the most success and or you have the largest risk footprint? Yeah, um, I would say not yet. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what we've done with trying to kind of create a, a way to describe the samples and their similarity, that's, that's been uh, very manual on, on trying to understand it. The great thing, though, is that if I analyze process injection, the threat of process injection to me is the same as the threat to process, of process injection to you. So, like, I can give you my output and it's going to be the exact same exact same problem now implementing the solution might be slightly different right because you may have uh different systems you may have different software that you've installed on those systems that are performing that are doing different things that might might cause those false positives that we talked about um i will say that like things like 
atomic red team. There's a lot of products out there that, that are uh, kind of doing automated purple teaming in the sense or automated um, security control testing maybe. Um, and the, the key though is, is that the devil's in the detail. So it's one thing to be able to run a test against, uh, we were inspired very much by atomic red, um, but it's one thing to run the test. It's another thing to make sure that the tests that you're running are the, uh, the um, optimal set of tests, right? So you have 4.4 million variations. Uh, a typical atomic red team might have like 10 different test cases for a, for a behavior. Well, what are the chances that those 10 test cases are the optimal set of 10 to represent that 4.4 million, uh, kind of like master set. And so you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be very diligent about what test cases you're selecting. A lot of times people will run something like, uh, you'll run Mimi cats, the standard kind of like binary form of it. And then you'll run invoke Mimi cats. And so the difference is, is the mechanism of execution. One is C, C plus plus, the other is PowerShell. And so like that, that may make a difference in whether you detect it or not, but under the hood, they're running the exact same uh, behavior, but there's other ways to implement, to achieve the same outcome, which is getting credentials from, from LSAS memory uh, without in a different way, like a significantly different way that would invalidate a lot of assumptions. Jared, talk to me about privilege escalation for a moment in the context of, I find vendors like Microsoft and others <clears throat> tend to dismiss lower level vulnerabilities because they're like, oh, the attacker would like need to get on the system and then escalate their privileges to administrator. And once they get there, like it's game over anyway. And obviously this comes from where I work today, you know, at Eclipsium, the lower level yeah. firmware vulnerabilities. I'm like, yes, but if an attacker is going to be able to persist at those lower levels, like it's really game over for you. Like you're not going to easily be able to eject that attacker from your network and you're not going to easily be able to stop them from wiping your system sometimes permanently. Yet larger vendors are like, oh, well, you should just not let like threat actors be on your system. So I'm like, well, if we could all do that, then we can all go home, right? Yeah. Like we, we can all retire, yeah. right? You know? I mean, the I think the, the idea that you could stop somebody from getting on a system, um, is going to, it's going to be difficult, right? Obviously, that's the that's the whole assume breach kind of mentality. I yeah. don't know what everybody's opinion is of, of that, but, but I think that that's probably a fairly safe bet. Um, yeah. One of the things that, that we talk about is, uh, you know, at Spectre Ops, we're really into uh, this idea of attack path management, which is kind of represented with Bloodhound, and the idea that um, you can evaluate somebody's ability to uh, kind of steal identities and then expand their access to resources throughout the enterprise. Um, and you could you could actually map that out, and so you could start to reduce their ability to move from one system to another. Mm. And so there's there's kind of like this this idea of like yeah you could become admin on this computer, but that's not quite as good as being being able to become admin on multiple computers, right? So there's there's almost like the admin of admins, the meta admin, which is the ad, the domain admin for for instance. And so if we could stop them from getting getting admin on multiple computers, and we can con constrain their access to a single machine. Uh, there's very few single machines that are going to have a massive impact on a on a on a network. Um, within the context of like local privilege escalation, uh, that is a problem that kind of in my experience is just so broad and so um, there's there's so many different mechanisms for privilege escalation that wait the hold idea on you said process be... injection was four point four million. What's the number when we get to privilege escalation, Jared? Well, see, see, pro well. You could argue that process injection probably is a form of privilege I was escalation. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said that, I was like, and you were describing it earlier, and because I had this privilege escalation question yep. like in my memory bank uh, to ask you on this one, I was like, yeah, that it, it is a form, right? Because if you're able to jump into a different process that has higher um, privileges, or even just even just different, right? So different, um, yeah, because Windows is lot so of, weird of, like that. Yeah, a lot of times we focus like it's it's natural to think about higher, so like. Uh, we're very like at Spectre Ops, we're very interested in tier zero, which would be like uh, domain admin. But uh, basically the, the general idea is, is if you have control of anything that is at the domain domain admin level, then you, you would be tier zero, right? Mm. And so that's higher privilege. But then there's also a question of just because I like, is it possible to be success? Like red teamers, think about just a hypothetical situation. Is it possible for you to be successful on a red team operation? without ever becoming domain admin. 
Sure. And the answer is it depends on what your objective is. But of course, there are going to be scenarios where that's possible. So different access just means that potentially now if I could take even if the even if the other user is the same like equivalent user to me, right. it's potentially possible that they have access to resources that I would have not had access to right. initially. And so the the idea of an attacker is generally speaking, you want to expand your access to resources throughout the enterprise until you could access whatever it is that you that you're mm. really interested in. You may may know what that is, you may not know what that is initially. Res the resources like, or information, right? Like the other side that people don't always is consider is is IP and or uh, when we're talking about nation states, their access to that information may just be, you're right, like cross cross access on a user because it's information that someone else has. It's the same access just on someone else's box yeah. or if their level if, of if, organization. If you're lucky, you stumble across that text file or spreadsheet that has credentials in it. Yep. And then it's, then it's then it's almost like right? all the fancy privilege escalation they've got the window. I just gain access to something that had some more credentials in it. Yeah, and that's the thing too. It's like dom domain admin is actually just um, this is my opinion, but it's a proxy for I can access everything. Yeah. Right. So if I could get domain admin, then I could access whatever it was that I was interested in. But I potentially, in a lot of cases, can access the thing that I'm interested in without. So it's I would say yeah. it's uh, sufficient but not necessary to be domain admin. For instance. Sorry, Jeff has a question. Well, uh, well, question comments. Yep. A million years ago. Uh, when everything was a Unix platform, uh, you know, the goal was to get root, elevate your privileges mm -hmm. to root, similar to domain admin now for those yep. younger mm -hmm. folks out there. Um, and and I'm, I'm getting ready to give a talk on this uh, in the coming year, a uh, uh, shameless plug. But uh, in the early days of my commercial consulting career, where I was a pen tester and we didn't have fancy terms like red team and blue team, Yep. We just did pen testing, but it was really a vulnerability assessment, um, if you ask me. But uh, you know, we were we were always kind of stymied by we would get root and then show that to the client, and they'd be like, "Yeah, so what?" Uh, so I'd say we lost the argument a long time ago on you know all that you know was we understand was the implication of getting the God account, getting getting yep. access to everything. Um, uh, I've been wanting to ask for a while and looking for a place to break in. You just mentioned recently objectives, but that was one of the questions I, I had for you is in, in this philosophy, uh, I feel like you need more than just a, a, a gloss over to objectives saying, well, it depends on the objective. To me, it's key to have an objective as to whether you call this a red team exercise, blue team exercise, vulnerability assessment, penetration test, whatever you want to call it, what are the objectives? You're starting to touch on it now by, well, very often if I want to get some particular data set, I don't need to do this, this, and this, because there's a million ways to Sunday to get to it. Um, yep. So, you know, that's more of a comment, maybe a question, you know, I guess the, to put it in the form of a question, yep. uh, you know, what, what do you what do you emphasize for your clients in terms of objectives going in? And but I'm more curious about how are you how are you reporting and yeah. is it measurably different? How do you score people? How do you get them to have that warm fuzzy that okay we're doing the right things we're doing well? Given that you only tested 300 out of four million possibilities. Yeah, so there um, probably a multi multi stage answer, but the like. When when I talk about purple teaming, and this this may actually be a problem, right? So like to to your point, uh, we typically are focused on for purple teaming. We're doing a technical test for technical people. So the idea is is generally they already kind of understand or bought into the idea that that they need to solve this problem of detection. Um, however, okay. a lot of times, a lot of times the red team. So I, I say that red team's not it's not the appropriate kind of testing protocol for solving the security control efficacy problem, right? That doesn't mean that red teams are not useful, right? Um, one, of the, one of the things that red teams are most useful is demonstrating impact and getting buy-in from kind of uh, corporate leadership to, to be interested in making sure that the, that the network is actually secure. That, that's one of potentially many reasons why a red team might be useful. So um, a lot of times we have we have customers on the purple team side that would be that would already be interested in they understand the threat they're trying to actually solve that 
Other times we might need to do something as a demonstration to kind of show, Hey, here's, here's an example. And, um, there's, there's all kinds of stories on the red team side of like, yeah, how do Jared, you get, I want to of... share with you one of those stories uh, that sure. Jeff just reminded me of, right. Is, uh, and I want to take it to a Linux Unix example of root. Yes. I can get root on one system. Right. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, unless you've got LDAP and other identity things that are maybe somewhat antiquated today, maybe still in, in use today, certainly that aside, right. I get root on <laughs> one system. NIS or NIS plus, but I'm dating Correct. myself. Sure. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But so I get root on one system. The way I've leveraged that is very much the way Jared, you articulated kind of going around in a windows domain. So I get root on one system, but really, yes, that gives me full privileges on that system. Great. But I need to get access to a lot of other systems what that affords me the luxury of in a Linux Unix environment is now I have access to any user that's on there and their private keys. And if I can mm. steal all their private keys, now I have access to systems that they have access to and I can greatly expand. So it's not so much the fact that I got root and that's the end of the pen test. No, I got root. But the the thing that I did with that was I stole all the other users' credentials, essentially, mm-hmm. in their private SSH keys, which afforded me the luxury to basically log on to, you know, 80% of the other systems in your environment and then rinse, lather, and repeat. And it's essentially the equivalent at that point at, at domain admin. Windows is very uh, a different animal in that there is kind of that domain level account, right, that would give you access to everything. But I love your yep. example of, yeah, but without domain admin, if I can gain access to enough other accounts... I can still accomplish my objectives, depending on what those are. Yeah, similar speak, similarly speaking, some some systems are more important than others and have an yeah. operational impact, right? And so, Correct. if uh, the the goal is to you know get access directly or indirectly to some, and then demonstrating the at least the ability to have some sort of operational impact on those systems, I I would imagine. Now, of course, like if it's an airline or if it's a financial services company, there's going to be different impacts that you're going to want to demonstrate um and there's potentially different well call you know, me old-fashioned yeah you're old but fashioned. isn't or shouldn't the goal thank you shouldn't the goal in most cases Dude, be demonstrating that you yeah i am ancient fashion to steal something <laughs> to gain access to data some some idea of crown jewel sensitive information proprietary information pii ppi phi dare i say pci data but yeah. i mean to me isn't that more pragmatic cut into the chase. I mean, I've been hearing you describe, it sounds like you're just testing the technology, you're testing the automation, you're testing how well they've implemented it, which I'm not wanting to delegitimize, but there's a yep. whole lot more to it than that, especially on this show. You know, every couple months we we bitch and moan about we do all this fancy stuff. We got all these great technology solutions, and somebody gets popped in a major way because somebody didn't steal, you know change their password. I just want to say if delegitimize wasn't a word before, it is now. Can't it is I think now. it's a legit. I'm I think it's sure a it legitimate, is. legitimate word. It's a legitimate yeah, word. <laughs> there you go. I would I would say that yeah. Of course the uh, the goal is to steal like. Well, Steal just like in just just like in every just like in you know uh, I come from the military, but you have you have uh, intelligence gathering operations, and you have you know maybe more destructive operations. Obviously, if you're a red team, you're probably not going to be destructive in the same way that a real bad guy would be, so to speak. But um, you might be able to demonstrate impact through something that's not necessarily information gathering. Although I think information gathering would probably be the primary. Uh, primary way to de- primary way to demonstrate impact. Now, do, like I, one well, of your I questions mean, is, is I, that... I just I want to just take a moment because I just watched this movie, mm-hmm. and I don't <laughs> think it's a hacker movie that many of us have have. Seen. Have you guys seen the German movie Who Am I? Anyone? Are no. you going to see no. hackers? No, no, no. no but no, I've read no. the man page. Is that the is that the <laughs> right. flip side to Cuckoo's Egg movie? No, nope. nope. is nope. this a different movie? No, nope. okay. this is okay. a total standalone uh, thing. And I want to spoil it uh, for you because I, I think it, it is a really great uh, film. I think it's a uh, the hacking scenes are more accurate than the ones depicted in Hackers. Not that that's saying much, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, unlike they, sneakers, which is completely the, accurate, the hacking group portrayed in the movie that's uh, pretty much led by the, the the main character in the film very much is objective based, right? <laughs> like their hacking and shenanigans have a, a, like a very very clear agenda. In fact, they they develop their hacks based on the objective first. They're like, we want to do this, and then they kind of work their way backwards from that to, to accomplish that 
uh, objective. And I think in hearing you folks talk, it kind of reminded me, I watched this movie the other night, um, you know, of that, that uh, we need to, I think, in both offensive and defensive operations, have the objectives in mind, right? Not just the defensive, but if you're on the defense, have the uh, offense objectives in mind so you know what they're after and then reverse engineer your way back from that. And I yep. think that's very much what you're talking about in terms of purple teaming, Jared, right? Is, well, their objective is the, the way to get to their ultimate objective is this first objective. Let's understand all the different ways they could accomplish that objective and become really resilient at that one. And then Kelly kind of keep moving up the if attack chain, if you will, which I hate that term, but sure. attack chain in, in doing that. I think it's a valid strategy, regardless of what you're trying to defend, right? Yep. 100%. And that like, um, maybe, maybe by understanding the operationally, uh, relevance, so to speak systems, you might be able to prioritize your, your kind of technical solutions. Uh, better, right? I find that a lot of a lot of organizations don't necessarily understand those operational systems, and so it's actually a lot of times the red team. Like one of the benefits of the red team is that they start to get an understanding for the information flows and how different systems are connected, so that they they tend to be able to share that information with the end user a lot a lot more often than than we would like to think, probably. Right. Yeah, I think I'd like to pull on that thread a little bit. So in, in case I'm wrong, and Jared, if, you know, if you disagree with me, please, please do. But like, I, I feel like pretty much through this interview, what, what we've been talking about has been like kind of like defensive red teaming is what what I've heard. Right. So uh, when, when you're talking about the process injection and all of those kind of things, I, what I'd really like to hear, you know, just kind of talk about like, what does it look from a from a defender's uh, standpoint? You know, engaging with you guys or, or doing a doing a purple team exercise. Like, what uh, what what do you what you know? How do you sell it? Like, what what uh, you know? Sure. What should they expect out of out of doing that? Bill, when I when yeah. I heard Jared describe his philosophy, just to kind of interject for a moment, because it's relevant to your question, is that I kind of use the term fuzzing. I'm like. You're doing like mm. controlled fuzzing, and I'm not like fuzzing a binary because I'm reverse engineering looking for vulnerabilities, but I'm fuzzing a, a, a process in, an, in a defensive state. And like the, the fuzzing kind of philosophy was was really the thing that that went to my you know where my brain went when I, I you described yeah. this to me, Jared. The I would so fu so sometimes you're literally fuzzing because there are there are EDR vendors that have detections and they'll tell you we detect. This thing. X or yeah, behave, right. behavior X. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, well, how do you do it? And they're like, oh, well, that's proprietary. So just trust us. And so as sure. a end user, uh, it doesn't make for a very good story as like a CISO or a technical lead or something like that to say, oh, well, they just told us that they're good and they're pretty smart. So we'll just, we'll just trust them. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you, what you want to do is you want to start essentially fuzzing it. And so what you, what you say is, how does this thing work? What are the different variables that I could be changing? And then you want to basically perform fuzzing, which is where you change one variable at a time until you get it to break. And then basically, then you start to triangulate what, what's actually happening here behind the scenes. But Jared, um, what you just described though, I mm -hmm. would like to believe that the uh, cybersecurity defensive companies are doing that on their own, right? The good ones are probably doing some of those same exercises on their own. Right. I, mm. Yeah, I think that's true. I think there's um, not uh, not to sound hubristic, if that's a word, but like I think that one of the problems is is I have this idea of I, I did a workshop on this at NorSec uh, last year called malware morphology. And so, if you're familiar with morphology in the context of like linguistics, it's the idea that as uh, language spread, for instance, you have Latin and then you have the Romance languages that are based mm -hmm. on that. Uh, words words change slightly, and you can start to uh, pull back, for instance, before Latin, there was like Proto-Indo-European, right? And you can start to actually recover lost languages as a result of understanding how languages change or how they how they morph over time. And so, for instance, in Latin, the word for grass is erba, but in uh, Italian, it's erba with with no H. So the H drops off, and that's a typical kind of behavior for mm. uh, for languages over time. Anyway, the the Do idea you, here whoa, is, is that stop, 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 stop. Do you know Mouse Sandy Clark, Doctor Sandy Clark? I do not. Yes, I do. You need to look her up. She did okay. an amazing study on malware evolution. And you two could have hours and hours of conversation mm. about that. Okay. Sandy yeah, Clark, that's... mouse. Okay. Mouse? Like the yeah. like the animal mouse? Yeah, that's her that's her handle. Mouse. Oh, okay. But Dr. Perfect. Sandy Clark. 
Perfect. I'll check it out. Um, yeah. And so the, the idea, the idea generally is, is that, um, trying to think of where I was going with that. As, as we start to think about morphology, we can start to predict the way that things are going to change. Right. And so as we're like doing this fuzzing, we can, we can start to say, based on our understanding of how kind of defensive capabilities work. So it's particularly preventative controls. So if a, if a EDR or some sort of security security product stops something from happening, um, then we could assume that attackers are going to run into that, especially for like really popular security products. Uh, attackers are going to run into that and they're going to change specifically to avoid that thing, right? And so we can start to figure out, we could fuzz, what is that, what is that security control focused on? They're focused on detecting the, the thread being created. Well, the attacker is going to change that. And so like in process injection, we have an example to where the typical canonical example is you create a thread to execute the malicious code, but then attackers realize, oh, well, I don't have to create a thread. I can just hijack an existing thread. And so if my detection strategy is based on thread creation, then, you know, I hijack, I hijack an existing thread that no threads ever created. And now your detection fails. I don't actually remember if that was exactly what the question was, but no, um, I love, but I love that because I, <clears throat> I feel like you could train an AI model or begin to train an AI model to do that, right? Based on what you described, Jared, I thought it was very, very astute to point that out that we can study how language changes. Can we can also study how attacker trends change that. and almost yep. be able to predict, right, what's coming next with some kind of AI model? I'm not the world's foremost expert on that, but yeah, just hearing sure. you talk and know. Talking to people way smarter than me on, on AI and machine reminds learning. Reminds you that you don't know it all. It reminds me that I don't know it all, but I've interviewed uh, people that do and could probably like <laughs> riff on that idea and go, yeah, we could probably make something of that. All right. So um, I don't know how much time we have left, but I Four just minutes. remembered what the what the point I was going for was. Go for it. So um, imagine that things, any anything in the world exists at multiple levels of resolution. So imagine that you have an apple. Well, that that apple is simultaneously a Granny Smith apple, an apple and a fruit, right? And so it exists in what they call like the subordinate category the, and the superordinate category. So, so the it's, fruit it's would be Schrodinger's super- apple. Gotcha. Okay, carry sure. on. Sure. Yep. <laughs> yep. And so, so the idea is, is that malware can be analyzed at multiple levels of granularity, so to speak. And one of, the, one of the problems that I see anyway is that a lot of times malware analysts have a tendency to focus on really minute details about how things work. Um, and so what, what happens is they're focused on changes at a lower level of analysis, uh, than what I think is important. Right. And so I talk about the functions. Well, there's a bunch of other details in a binary, for instance, besides the API functions that it right. calls. There's if, things if like fruit, variable if names. If fruit were malware, like fruit is fruit, I really don't care if it's an apple, an orange or a banana or whatever. Fruit is fruit. Yeah. But the, here's the key, right? So the key is, is that you want to, I say you want to comprehend the malware in the way that you apprehend the malware, right? And so, so the idea is, is that you want to think about it at the level that's appropriate based on your ability to see what's going on. And the, the way that we see things in a cyber environment, at least today, is through logging, right? And so uh, EDR logs is kind of the trend right now. Mm-hmm. And so you have to think about what are the things that our EDR logs are actually telling us? What are, what are the EDR logs showing us? And what they're showing us is effectively, it's not literally this, but it's effectively function execution. Mm-hmm. A lot of times a single log will tell you about a bunch of different functions, but they're all kind of doing the It's same not thing. telling me if it's a, kung, a kumquat or a kiwi. That's right. <laughs> well, it's not telling me, it might not be telling me that it's a Granny Smith or a Red Delicious or something like I was that. But it's telling me Bill, this is, I was waiting yeah. for Bill's response to that. He's like, F and Paul. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of, you, you predicted that was coming. <laughs> yeah. And so, so what we're, I guess like to the question of like, aren't the security vendors doing this? I think what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, Hey, this is the level of analysis that we should be thinking about. And here's a framework for which you can think, which you can use to describe a malware sample, this malware sample call. And like, it's, it's actually obvious, right? So like when I first, the first SANS class I took on reverse engineering, they're like process injection calls these four functions. Well, at the time I didn't understand that that's just one example of process injection, right? But that was a proper way to describe what that, what that sample was doing. Yeah. And, and then Jared, the question is, it, w- yeah. what you're describing to me, in fact, I think I just, I described something very similar in a webinar today, right? This is in my opinion, the like a bleeding edge kind of research that's going into analyzing software, malware and regular software to go like, basically, is this software bad or good? Right. Yep. And I yep. think we have like the 
the building blocks to do this. I know in Tezzer was um, a vendor that sticks out in my mind because they were comparing like, hey, if I know this malware sample and I can compare it to this other potential malware sample and I can maybe do static analysis or maybe do decompilation, right? And I can compare them. However, I'm comparing, there's lots of different ways to do that. I compare them and go, these are pretty similar, right? And we could we could use AI and machine learning to go, are, how similar are these things based on, the, on these inputs? I think that's pretty similar well, not, to what you're talking about. Not to go about. off on a tangent, Paul, but how do you distinguish, where do you draw the line between normal software and malware? Yeah, I think it's been um, behaviors, Jeff, that are largely defined by humans based on also inputs from known bad and known good. I believe we have the building blocks to build models to then distinguish like this software is doing something bad. This software is not. And I'm not saying it's perfect today. I'm but not saying we're there, but we're on normal, this path. Normal software that has certain features that could be exploited or, or used for I, way, you know, ways other than originally intended could arguably be called malware. So I think it's a blurry line. Oh yeah. It's very much a blurred line. Like when we talk about drivers, yes, this is a completely 100% legitimate driver. It's signed by Microsoft, but threat actors are using it in a bad way. And that's a, that's mm -hmm. a very, you bring up a very good point, Jeff. That's a very challenging thing. Jared's nodding his head, right? Cause you know yeah, where, so, where we're going with this one. So in detection, what we're trying to identify is, did this thing occur? And then there's a question of, was that thing good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, in order to discern good or bad, you have to put it into the context of what's happening, yeah. right? So there's like, when we do a detection, generally speaking, we're detecting like a single thing. And sometimes there's correlations and all that kind of stuff that gives us more context. But you you put it into, into a greater context that allows you to say, okay, they did this thing and that makes me suspicious because they created a service on a remote system well, that's a primitive for lateral movement, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this was lateral movement. It could have just been administration. Yeah. But then you say, okay, well, when that service actually executed, what was what happened then, right? So it's it's but vulnerabilities it you on the, the same trail. thing. I'm having this conversation, um, you know, part of my day job, right? Not to give too much away, but I'm like, you know, you, sure, you could like decom decompile stuff and look for store copy, but there's a lot of things that do that, and they're largely like inaccurate. It's the the yep. context. And what that's used in, I think, in fact, there was a chat GPT generated vulnerability report for curl. And it was just like, well, you're using stir copy. And is it, is it Daniel? Is Daniel the maintainer of curl? I love this man. He did a great uh, interview on open source security podcast, right? And has dealt with a whole bunch of crap lately. And he's like arguing, like not knowing necessarily that it's an AI. I'm not sure if he did or not, but he was like, it's the context. He's like, you got to look like, two or three lines before that where I'm checking the boundaries, right? And these automated tools are like, well, I'm just, you're using stir copy. And I'm like, well, your automated tool is like just grep. Like you need context around that. But I think it's the yep. same thing we're talking about with malware. It's one thing to go like, I think this is malicious, but it's those other contexts that you have to build in an automated fashion to really paint the picture of, no, this is really something malicious versus yeah, someone may be using this function, but they're using it in a totally fine way, right? And I think we're we're on this cusp where we're able to develop technology to uh, find these things in an automated fashion, which is exciting to me. Yep, and the detection hey, Jared, helps you. I'm, I'm, go, go ahead, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm just interested to hear, uh, so w when you're on an engagement and you were to find, you know, you were to test one of the the alternate methods of, of process injection or whatever you're, whatever sure. you're after, and you and you find that you do pass bypass the the EDR or whatever protection mechanisms are in place. Is that something you just put in your pocket, or you know, like how do you feel about the ethics of that? Like, is that something that you report to the EDR? Like, wh what do you do with that information? Oh, good question. Yeah, um, it's a good question. We we report it to the customer, um, but we don't necessarily report. It. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. That's a good. That's a great question. We. We report it to whoever hired us to do the test, but we don't like, I haven't thought about reporting it to other people that are affected. I think in some cases we probably do, but it's not a systemic, it's not a systemic decision, which uh, would probably be, I, I would say that that's a good idea. Um, yeah. And we, we do measure, we try to measure kind of like, did you prevent it? Did you alert on it? And, or did you see it? And that helps us to discern, uh, like, did you stop it from happening? 
did you raise an alert, but that alert could just go by the wayside and people could just ignore it, right? Mm -hmm. Or do you even have the capability to extend your your detection you know suite to solve this problem in the first place and so those are those are the types of things and that information would be good for the customer but also the vendor so that's a that's a good uh good remark i, I appreciate that jared i love this conversation by the way it was very very thought-provoking especially that stuff towards the end we we're talking about really new uh techniques which i think is really exciting um to uh make the world a better place right so awesome. thank you so much for appearing on paul security weekly yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And happy birthday, Paul. Thanks, Thank everybody you. else. Uh, good seeing you, Tyler. <laughs> with that, we will take a short break and come back with the security news. Stay tuned.